They have between them participated in 271 FOMC meetings. That includes some double and triple counting. Uh, in short, if you believe that the United States monetary policy has been good over the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, you have them to think. If you think it's been bad, you have these three people to blame. Ben Bernanke, after a long academic career, mainly at Princeton, came to Washington as a Federal Reserve Governor, uh, and then chaired the Fed from 2006 to 2014. Janet Yellen, after a similarly accomplished academic career at Berkeley, served as a Fed Governor, President of the San Francisco Fed, and Chair of the Central Bank from 2014 to 2018. Uh, and Jay Powell is a former Treasury official and private equity executive. He has chaired the Central Bank for the last 11 months. Uh, Chair Powell is not an economist, actually. Uh, he has a law degree. Uh, this does sound like the start of a joke. Uh, what happens when a lawyer walks into a conference with 13,000 economists? Uh, the punchline is, we're about to find out. <laughs> uh, so let's dive in first with you, uh, Chair Powell. Uh, since the December FOMC meeting, it was only two weeks ago, shockingly, uh, markets have been volatile. We've seen some real pessimism in some uh, economic surveys. Uh, we also saw a blockbuster jobs report this morning. Uh, look, you've been optimistic about that. Is that changing? What is your outlook for uh, 2019 and beyond? Well, thanks very much, Neil. It's great to be here. Also great to be with Janet and Ben, as always. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about 2018 and then turn to the outlook, if I may. So 2018, uh, by so many measures, was a good year for the United States economy. And uh, most of the hard data that we see coming in remain quite solid and suggest ongoing momentum heading, in, heading into 2019. You mentioned this morning's jobs report. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, we had 312,000 payroll jobs added, a very strong number. Uh, we have uh, unemployment remaining uh, below 4% for nine months now, the longest period since uh, the mid-1960s. We have labor force participation picking up again and surprising to the upside, which is, is very, very welcome. And finally, we have wages, which are, are continuing to gradually move up. Average hourly earnings moved up, uh, and uh, that's, that's quite welcome. And also, for me at this time, doesn't, does not raise uh, you know, concerns about too high inflation. So very strong report today. We've also seen, uh, on a more forward-looking basis, we've seen initial claims for unemployment insurance uh, near their historic lows. And so that's more of a, that's more of a uh, leading indicator, and we still see you know, real strength there. Uh, consumer spending has been strong right through December. The reports we're getting from the retail industry suggest continuing spending right through the holiday season. Um, so uh, you know, I would say those are, those are all good data points. There is yesterday's uh, Institute for Supply Management report, which came in well below expectations. And I, I would just provide a little bit of context there. The, the ISM report is a survey of manufacturing conditions, and uh, it had been at historically high levels, in fact, higher than it had been even in the strong expansion of the late 1990s, and much higher than it had been during more, much of this uh, expansion. So it's now at a level which is considered uh, consistent with ongoing moderate growth, um, and is about at the level or even higher than it's been in the earlier years of this recovery. So that's a little bit of context. I would say the, the, the fact that it moved down uh, so much in one month is something uh, worth keeping an eye on. So not, notwithstanding that report, though, um, I would say uh, U.S. data seem to be, uh, seem to be uh, on track to sustain good momentum into the new year. Um, I'll talk about China for a second. China's been a big part of this story. And uh, the, the, the most recent data from China have been more mixed. China's consumers appear to be pulling back, as seen in the Apple news and in the weak retail sales data. The two PMI reports we got earlier this week show softening in domestic and external demand. And this weakness seems to be spilling over to other emerging Asian economies and to global commodity prices, such as copper, for which China is such a big buyer. That said, Chinese authorities are responding with additional stimulus, and China and the rest of emerging Asia should continue to expand at a still, poly, a still solid pace this year. So overall, I would say that the picture for the rest of the world remains consistent with continued growth here in the United States. So good data still, I think, is the story uh, looking in the rearview mirror. But financial markets uh, have been sending uh, different signals, single signals of concern about downside risks, um, about slowing global growth, particularly related to China, about ongoing trade negotiations, about what uh, maybe let's call general policy uncertainty coming out of Washington, um, and among other factors. So uh, you know, you, you do have this, uh, this difference between, on the one hand, strong data and some tension between financial markets that are signaling concern and downside risks. 
And the question is, with those contrasting sets of factors, how should we think about the outlook and how should we think about monetary policy going forward? Now, when we get conflicting signals, as is not infrequently the case, policy is very much about risk management. And I'll offer a couple of thoughts on that to wrap up. Um, first, uh, as always, there is no preset path for policy. Um, and particularly with the muted uh, inflation readings that we've seen coming in, uh, we will be patient as we watch to see how the economy evolves. Uh, but we're always prepared to shift the stance of policy and to shift it significantly if necessary in order to promote our statutory goals of maximum employment and stable prices. And I'd actually like to point to a recent example when the committee did just that in early 2016. And I mentioned this in this December press conference in passing. As, as many of you will recall, in uh, December 2015, when we lifted off from the zero lower bound, the median FOMC participant uh, expected four rate increases for 2016. But very early in the year, in 2016, financial conditions tightened quite sharply. And under Janet's leadership, the committee nimbly, and I would say flexibly, adjusted our expected rate path. We did eventually uh, raise rates a full year later in December 2016. Meanwhile, the economy weathered a soft patch in the first half of uh, 2016 and then got back on track. Uh, and policy, gradual policy uh, normalization resumed. Now, no one knows whether this year will be, will be like 2016. But what I do know is that we will be prepared to adjust policy quickly and flexibly and to use all of our tools to support the economy, should that be appropriate, to keep the expansion on track, to keep the labor market strong, and to keep, to keep uh, inflation near 2 percent. And I will stop there. Thanks. So, so Chair Powell, uh, as you note, since the last FOMC meeting, markets have moved in big ways. Ten-year Treasury yield is down a quarter percentage point. The Fed Fund's futures path is suggesting no rate increases, maybe even rate cuts in 2019. Are the markets telling you that you made a mistake? I think the markets are, are, are pricing in uh, downside risks is what I think they're doing. And I think they're, they're obviously well ahead of the data, particularly if you look at this morning's labor market data and the other data uh, that I cited. So markets are expressing concerns, again, about, about uh, global growth in particular. I think that's becoming the main focus and, and trade negotiations, which are related to that. And I'll just say that we're, we're listening carefully to that. We're listening with, you know, sensitively to the message that, that markets are sending. And we're going to be taking those downside risks into account as we make policy going forward. Now, at your press conference, you uh, affirmed that you intend to allow the balance sheet to continue uh, <coughs> shrinking at a steady rate. Uh, would you reconsider those plans in light of this flexibility you spoke about a moment ago? Yeah, so let, me, let me talk about the balance sheet. Uh, you know, some, some years ago, uh, we decided that, um, that rate policy was going to be the active tool, policy tool and that the balance sheet would be allowed to, to shrink gradually and predictably in the background. Uh, and it was supposed to be about as interesting as watching paint dry in, in Janet's famous uh, locution. So, uh, and that, that division of labor has served us well. And we think... Um, has served the economy well. And uh, so we also said at the very beginning, um, I think in our original, uh, certainly the first uh, um, policy normalization plans that I was involved in in 2014, we said that uh, we would be prepared to adjust our normalization plans uh, as appropriate to achieve our goals. So if we ever came to the conclusion that uh, any aspect of our normalization plans was, was somehow interfering with our achievement of our statutory goals, we wouldn't hesitate to change it. And that would include the balance sheet, certainly. So I would say today, of course, we're, we're, we're hearing a lot from uh, um, different uh, groups of people about the role that the uh, balance sheet uh, normalization may be playing in, in the markets. I think we are of the view that what really happens mechanically when uh, uh, you know, when our securities mature, is Treasury issues a comparable amount of securities, but they do so across the yield curve. The, the amounts are, are not that big. They haven't been that big compared to the issuance Treasury is already undertaking. So we don't believe that our issuance is, is a, an important part of the story of the market turbulence that, that began in the fourth quarter last year. But I'll say again, if we reached a different conclusion, we wouldn't hesitate to, to make a change. If we came to, came to the view that that, that the balance sheet normalization plan or any other aspect of normalization was part of the problem, we wouldn't hesitate to make a change.
So let's broaden our conversation now. Dr. Yellen, if this expansion lasts into next summer, it'll be the longest on record. You played a significant role in, in making that the case. Uh, how confident are you that this economy is on track to keep growing through 2019? Uh, how worrying do you find these latest moves in markets and some of the survey data? Well, I agree with Chair Powell's assessment that he just offered up. The data suggests we have a pretty strong economy, consumers, you know, consumer spending is two-thirds of all the spending in the economy um, with strong job growth and income growth, um, debt burdens having been reduced substantially, um, housing prices having risen, oil prices down, putting some money in consumers' pockets. Um, I think <coughs> consumer spending, and we just, it looks, um, as Jay said, uh, is though spending over Christmas was strong. Uh, that's a strong base for the economy next year. Um, I don't think that expansions just die of old age. Um, two things usually end them. Um, one is financial imbalances, and the other is um, the Fed. And um, usually when the Fed ends a recession, it ends um, an expansion, it's because inflation has gotten out of control and the Fed needs to tighten to bring it down. And um, I think the Fed is now very well positioned with inflation being low and inflation dynamics being favorable in the sense that the linkage, so I believe that there is a linkage between slack in the labor market and product markets and inflation, but the strength of that linkage is not very great. Um, so we have a relatively flat Phillips curve is another way of putting that. And in addition, inflation expectations seem well anchored, and so um, inflationary dynamics are very favorable. Um, it gives my former colleagues um, the opportunity to be um, careful, to move gradually, to be data dependent, to manage the risks and I have confidence that they'll be able to do that. And um, I don't really see financial imbalances in the economy at this point that um, look to be threatening. So, of course, we have had a tightening of financial conditions. Um, markets are obviously worried about downside risk. There are some, um, we are seeing some slowing in the global economy. I believe growth is likely to slow um, quite a bit next year, but still likely end up being above the growth rate of potential, which is consistent with a strong labor market and maybe even some further tightening. Dr. Bernanke, you, you uh, spoke once of a Wiley E. Coyote effect uh, <laughs> as this uh, fiscal stimulus impact of the tax cuts fades, uh, that we might find ourselves in a, in a bad spot over a cliff looking down. Uh, are, we, are we looking at that now? Is that part of what's being priced in, and how much is that fear something imminent? Well, I think we have an excellent chance of breaking the all-time record for an expansion, a 10-year expansion in the middle of, of next year. It's likely that the economy will grow more slowly in 2019 than in 2018, and maybe even more slowly in 2020. This is not something that is news. I mean, we've anticipated this for a long time because uh, the fiscal policy in particular that was enacted close to a full employment uh, starting point um, we knew that barring changes in the law that that stimulus was going to be dying down over time and that's that's certainly going to be um, uh, slowing growth uh, all else equal um, financial conditions were if anything a little bit ebullient you know in 2017 early 2018 to some extent what we've seen this tightening we've seen is a take back of some of that particularly with concerns about geopolitical considerations trade wars and the like um, and then, of course, you know, the sort of perfect confluence of synchronized growth we saw in 2017 is also globally has also been a little bit less uh, strong. So all these things do suggest some, some moderation. But as Janet says, expansions don't die of old age. I like to say they get murdered instead. Um, and right now, we, you know, right now we don't, I don't see any, anyone's cloaking behind, uh, hiding behind the curtains. Um, but some slowing does does seem likely. Let me just say, you know, that uh, it is a good thing that the Fed has the flexibility to respond in a way that is, will be responsive to the data, responsive to the markets, uh, and that manages the risks that are obviously on both sides of this. 
So uh, as all three of you know all too well, uh, being federal, uh, federal Reserve Chair is not just about economics. It is about navigating the political system, navigating Washington. Uh, that task has become trickier for your successor. Uh, Chair Powell, the, the President seems to be very unhappy with the path of rate increases. Uh, there has been reporting that he's uh, considered trying to fire you, which would raise uh, legal questions, uh, to, to put it mildly. Um, have, have you received any direct communication from the White House expressing displeasure? <laughs> Have you received anything direct from the White House uh, about uh, about unhappiness with uh, with the path of rates uh, or discussion of, of any uh, change in, in your job? No, I, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I have no news for you on that. Uh, There's also been discussion of a face-to-face -face meeting between you and the president. Uh, if invited, would you uh, would you accept that kind of invitation? If it were made. So again, I have no news on that. Nothing's been scheduled. Um, I would say that uh, meetings between presidents and Fed chairs do happen, yeah. and uh, they, they've happened. I think, in the, I can't think of any Fed chairs who didn't eventually meet with the president. But again, nothing, nothing has been scheduled, and I don't really have anything to report on that. If the president asked you to resign, would you do it? No. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bernanke, uh, you you worked under two presidents, uh, President Bush and President Obama. Can we broaden this discussion of the relationship <coughs> between the Fed chair and? and, and the political system. How uh, how did your interaction with those two presidents work? Uh, when a when a relationship works well, what uh, what happens? Well, I had a very good relationship with uh, President Bush, who initially appointed me, and I worked for him in the White mm -hmm. House for a time, and also with President Obama, who reappointed me. Uh, both of them uh, were very respectful of the Fed's independence on short-term interest rate decisions. Um, on a few occasions, in fact, uh, President Obama wryly commented to me that. He'd been criticized abroad for Fed actions, and he had to tell them, no, it really is not, <laughs> not our bailiwick and that uh, the Federal Reserve is making those. was a difficult time. For yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I had a good relationship with both of them, and I think it worked well that um, uh, the Federal Reserve is, of course, its goals are set by Congress. It is accountable to Congress. Uh, the Fed has become more and more transparent over time. I want to congratulate Jay on adding the four additional press conferences every year. Uh, it's very important that the Fed be accountable and transparent, but uh, it makes the best, the best outcomes occur if the individual interest rate decisions made in pursuit of those mandated objectives are done independently in a nonpartisan way, looking at the long-term goals uh, of the Fed. Um, and I, I think Jane and I were, were very lucky that uh, Presidents Bush and Obama were very respectful of that, and I think it worked well. I had a good relationship with, with the Treasury secretaries, with the other administration uh, officials, and kept them well informed and had, a, a, again, a friendly relationship. So I thought that was an ideal, uh, ideal arrangement. During the financial crisis, uh, we had to work, the Fed and the Treasury had to work quite closely on those issues, but I would separate some of those issues from pure monetary policy decisions, which were always left to the discretion of the Fed. Do you see President Trump's approach as problematic? In yeah, I, I think uh, everyone would be better off if, if it was clear that the Fed is making its decisions based on its mandate and on its assessment of the long-term needs of the economy, which I'm completely confident that it will do. Dr. Yellen, do you, do you believe that the President weighing in the way he has uh, poses long-term dangers for the, for the Federal Reserve and its independence and sound monetary policy? Well, I think only if it served ultimately to undermine public confidence in um, in the Fed, in the basis for its actions and um, its responsiveness to its mandate. Um, it, it had been a very long tradition. It, I think, began really with President Clinton to for presidents not to comment on particular Fed decisions. And um, I th think that helped exactly. to shore exactly. up the yeah, independence of the Fed and public confidence that the Fed was acting in a non-political way and, as Ben said, um, trying to make its best judgments to pursue its congressional mandate. I think that's the best um, kind of arrangement um, for a president vis-a-vis -vis the Fed. Obviously, the president has a right to comment on the Fed, but I would worry that if it continues or intensifies, that it could undermine confidence in the Fed and the market's confidence uh, in the Fed's judgment. Anything to add, or are you? Sure. Uh, no. I, look, I just want to. I do want to add something. <clears throat> I want to say that uh, 
Um, people should know that the Fed has a very strong culture around uh, non-political um, activity. And what, you know, we, we are committed to achieving the goals that, that the law gives us, and we're committed to doing so in a completely non-political way, based on the best thinking, based on the diversity of perspectives. And we're always going to do that. It's, it's very much in the DNA of anyone who's spent any time at the Fed. So I would want the public to be assured that we have a strong culture. It's not a fragile one. It's not subject to being disrupted. Uh, we, we will always do things that way. And I, I, would, I would, again, want people to have confidence in that. Let's talk a little about uh, kind of the mechanisms of monetary policy. Uh, Dr. Bernanke, uh, you spent your academic career looking at ways that at zero lower bound one could ease monetary policy. It uh, became very real in, during your chairmanship. Um, knowing what you know now, uh, what, uh, what might you do differently during the financial crisis as we know about these different tools, quantitative easing, forward guidance, credit easing, the various approaches uh, you took? Uh, what are the lessons we've learned about uh, what works and what might be useful if we find ourselves in another downturn? We're talking about monetary policy monetary specifically. Policy. Yeah. So, I mean, one of, the, one of the things we learned was that with long-term interest rates being generally lower around the world, that the risk of hitting the zero lower bound or the slightly negative bound that we see in Europe uh, is a much more salient risk than we thought it was 20 years ago. And so dealing with that situation has become, you know, going forward is, is, a, is a greater risk. Um, you know, we, we uh, approached it, when we hit zero, we approached it by doing a couple of additional things. One was forward guidance, which was using uh, a language to communication to explain not just what we were doing currently with our rates, but what we would be expected to be doing in the future. And then quantitative easing, which was purchases of treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. Um, I think those things were constructive. Um, certainly the uh, concerns that some critics expressed that it was going to lead to hyperinflation and many other extreme outcomes was not correct. Um, I think we learned a lot about how to um, communicate and coordinate those policies. So I think in the future, while I, I, would, I hope that we won't be very frequently in the situation of being at zero short-term interest rates. Um, I think we do have some tools that could be used and, and that those things will still be in the toolbox. There are f further discussions, I don't want to take you too far off track, about you know, could we change the way we approach the, the target, the, the policy target, uh, for example, that would make monetary policy more effective at zero interest rates. You're supposed I was to mention a state contingent. Uh, so, yeah, you know, price level targeting or, or temporary price level targeting, some examples of that. Um, but uh, the, the Federal Reserve is doing a review currently of its uh, tools and its, its framework, and I think there'll be some interesting <coughs> discussions in that context about you know, whether the current inflation targeting framework needs modification or would there be ways of making monetary policy more effective at zero. But I think overall, I mean, the experience suggests to me that, that while the zero lower bound is a real constraint and makes it harder to manage monetary policy, there are some tools that can be used in that circumstance to, to get additional accommodation. Anything you want to add? Well, I, I agree. I think the tools um, were effective, should remain in the toolkit, um, and potentially can be strengthened. And I think it's very constructive that the Fed is going to undertake a review. I think one of the things that struck me looking back is that as late as um, 2012, I believe, you still had long-term interest rates that were around 3.5%. And in a way that reflected um, the public's view that this would be a short episode, that um, short rates would go back up more quickly. I mean, it was seven years that they stayed at zero. And I think we um, learned things from forward guidance using them um, after the financial crisis that we might be able in a future episode to communicate more quickly the likelihood that rates would stay low for a long time so that long-term rates would move down more force forcefully and quickly. But I think those tools worked. Chair sure, Powell, anything you can tell us about the Fed's contingency planning if there is a recession during your chairmanship? Uh, do we know which crisis era tools might be brought back? Is there anything you can rule out? Uh, how ready is the Fed if things do take a turn for the worse? Well, as I mentioned, we will use, <clears throat> we use all of our tools to the extent uh, appropriate. Uh, it, uh, we'll use the balance sheet, we'll use uh, the tools that we had. And I, I would agree with what uh, I think both Ben and Janet said, which is that the, the tools that we used in the crisis after hitting the zero lower bound generally worked. Uh, 
many raised concerns. I was the one who, who raised concerns when I first got to the Fed, and I, and I said some time ago that the, the concerns people raised, and it was appropriate to raise them, they didn't really kind of bear fruit. We didn't see high inflation. We didn't see asset bubbles. We didn't see those kinds of things. So, and the, the real thing is, though, uh, again, I'd echo what Ben said about this conference that we're having this summer, and in fact, we're spending a whole year thinking about this. We're trying to engage with the public, not just the profession, but with the public in general, to explain ourselves a little bit in this era of lower interest rates. How are we going to conduct policy? How are we going to uh, communicate uh, and use our tools in a way that keeps the inflation target credible and that serves the, you know, the, the, the goals that we're assigned? So I want to um, come back to something you mentioned during your opening comments. Um, both, uh, so, for example, in 2015, 2016, uh, Chair Yellen experienced a, a time when tightening, uh, tight, tighter monetary policy in the United States seemed to tighten financial conditions around the world, slowed growth in emerging markets, created feedback loops that affected the U.S. economy. Some real parallels to what we're seeing now. There are also some parallels to the taper tantrum in 2013 when uh, the signal that, that QE was not going to go on forever created some uh, feedback loops. I wonder, for those two episodes in each of your chairmanships, can you reflect on the lessons you learned that are relevant for, for current policy and what, uh, what you learned out of that episode that, um, that should be internalized as, as Fed officials work today? Well, I think looking at risks um, or feedbacks that come from the global environment, clearly that's uh, an important um, factor shaping the domestic environment and um, it's something that monetary policy needs to take account of. And I think what um, we saw during that 2015-2016 episode is that U.S. monetary policy ended up having spillovers. And in general, monetary policy does have spillovers to other countries as um, the Fed raises rates or is expected to raise rates more quickly than um, those in the rest of the world. Uh, capital tends to be uh, attracted to the U.S. It tends to push up the dollar. Um, it tends to slow global growth, especially for countries emerging markets with dollar-denominated debt, both higher interest rates and weaker local currencies, raises the burden of that debt, um, can serve to slow growth uh, in the rest of the world, not necessarily, but may slow growth in the rest of the world. And then there may be feedbacks that can, in some cases, become quite relevant to the conduct of U.S. monetary policy. And Jay um, pointed to this in his opening uh, remarks. Certainly 2016 was an example of uh, a situation where linkages from U.S. monetary policy to global financial conditions and growth and back again, spillbacks to the U.S. outlook did lead to a significant um, revision of what the appropriate path of policy should be. And we ended up, uh, as Jay said, uh, in December of 2015 when we first raised rates, uh, the median in the uh, projections of the committee participants, they were looking for four rate increases during 2016. And these feedback loops were sufficiently strong that we ended up raising rates only once. And I don't have regrets about that. I, you know, sometimes it's difficult to predict how these things will play out, and that's why data dependence um, and being amenable to changing one's view um, if risks seem to be uh, feeding back to the U.S. outlook, why well, that's an appropriate way to proceed. Dr. Bernanke, the taper tantrum? Well, uh, so first in general, um, clearly what the Fed does has a big effect globally. The dollar is the international currency, so even when third countries trade with each other, often the invoices of the trade are, are in dollars, and international borrowing lending is typically in dollars, and so um, you know, we recognize that those effects are, um, are powerful, and they do feed back on the U.S. economy. Uh, we took seriously in the crisis in particular our role as global lender of last resort. The Fed, not, you know, got far less attention than some of the other things that we did during the crisis, but we, uh, we conducted uh, currency swaps with 14 central banks, including four emerging market central banks, to make sure they had access to dollars to help manage the shortages of dollars globally. And so we served, in some sense, as a global lender of last resort. So we were quite aware of these international factors. The paper tantrum, I think this is an example of where, in the future, we might do better. I, I think the, 
the, there was communication concern there in that um, uh, when we announced a contingent and very gradual slowdown in our purchases, I think it wasn't so much that slowdown as it was the inference that was taken in some quarters that this <coughs> meant an imminent increase in short-term interest rates. And we saw you know, the forward curve shifting up immediately, even in other currencies. Um, and so that it just shows you the subtlety of how these different tools interact. One of the roles of asset purchases is to offer a signal about where future rate policy is going to be. And so I think the, what happened in that episode was that, um, uh, again, there was an inference taken that policy rates were going to go up much more quickly than we intended. And we, we tried to be very clear about that. And we tried to clarify that. I think in the end, uh, the message came through, and the uh, effects, at least in the U.S. economy, turned out to be pretty minimal. But uh, we learned, uh, and I, uh, future central bankers will understand, the importance of coordinating the communications across the different elements of monetary policy, in this case, between asset purchases and, and rate guidance. Chair Powell, you were a governor during both of these episodes. Um, as you sit in this chair now, uh, part of this is the cost of being a global reserve currency. It makes your job more complicated. Uh, what lessons do you draw as you set policy over the months ahead? Well, a couple of things. First, the, um, the, the taper tantrum left uh, uh, scars on anybody who was working <laughs> at, at the Fed at that time. And I think the takeaway was that the market could be very sensitive to news about the balance sheet, to the pace of, uh, of normalization, anything like that. That's one of the reasons why why the balance sheet is supposed to be in the background, gradual and predictable paint drying as opposed to the active tool. We didn't want to have two active tools going at once, so that was, that was one of the things. Um, another takeaway, um, I agree with everything that Ben and Jan said, another takeaway is, um, so there, after, particularly after the taper tantrum, there was a great deal of back and forth over, you know, uh, do other countries have even freedom of monetary policy and that sort of thing. And I think so a lot of research has been done and um, you know, much of it by Fed people. And the sense of it is that the best thing that we can do, I think, is to be as transparent and predictable as possible, and that, you know, a strong U.S. economy is good for the world, and that sometimes the role of the U.S. monetary policy in other countries is, is exaggerated. Notwithstanding that, sometimes there's a real effect, and, and uh, it helps. If you're, one of, if you're a small open economy, you can address some of that with strong institutions, in particular with uh, floating exchange rate. Turn to something else, um, an argument that, that I've heard people wrestling with recently um, goes like this. Uh, for much of the, the post-Volcker rate moderation era, uh, the Fed has been very successful at keeping inflation low, uh, but often at the cost of tightening monetary policy and putting the brakes on, uh, on the economy whenever the job market is starting to get hot and unemployment gets very low. Uh, that This has the effect of helping asset prices as, as, uh, during periods of easy money, but then uh, essentially taking, uh, taking things away and, and not letting the economy heat up enough to really benefit workers and, and labor when, uh, when things are going well. Um, you know, the idea is that this is contributing to lack of bargaining power by labor, that this is part of the de declining labor share of national income and inequality. Dr. Yellen, you've, you've been guessing. part of the Fed for longer than, than guessing, the others guessing. here. Uh, is it a valid critique? Do you worry that uh, there's been a systematic uh, Willingness to, to, to let asset prices rise, but not worry as much about labor market outcomes. Well, I think um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, we've been totally focused on employment outcomes and um, willing to, in a way, take a data-dependent approach and have an open mind <laughs> about um, where the economy could go without generating, of course, you know, it's a dual mandate maximum employment and price stability, um, issues of where will inflation begin to set in in the face of labor market tightness, um, what is the natural rate of unemployment. The um, members of the FOMC have learned a lot about that over time. They have revised their views. Um, one of the things we have seen, and actually this was uh, an aspect of today's report, is um, although unemployment is historically low, we haven't had this low an unemployment rate in um, its close to 50 years. Um, we were uncertain just how much scope there was for labor force participation to um, contribute to uh, employment growth and to ease pressures that would otherwise be inflationary. And we've, um, in a way, 
been able to see very strong job growth and historically low unemployment rates because it's really not turned out to be inflationary and labor force participation um, has, has continued to increase. So um, certainly I don't think that's a fair criticism. That's been a very strong focus of the Fed. You mentioned, uh, Chair Powell, the, the wage growth we saw in t this morning's jobs report. Uh, you mentioned in your Jackson Hole speech, uh, not being, well, I don't, but in your words, how much should we trust estimates of the natural rate of unemployment? Um, how much should we say, this is a job market that isn't creating huge inflation yet, let's let it run and, and see where this leads? So we, we need the concept of the natural rate of unemployment because we need to know whether employment is, we need to have some sense of, of whether employment is high, low, or, or just right unemployment. Um, but we have to understand that it's, um, you know, that, that there's tremendous uncertainty around it, around the actual location of it. And we, we, we are in a, an era where inflation dynamics are such that the relationship between slack and changes in slack and inflation, changes in inflation, is, is very weak, but it's still there. It's, it's clearly still there in, in, in just about all the research that's been done. So I think we've been willing to revisit our views, very much willing to revisit our views of what the natural rate is and also our understanding of what it is. So in, you know, if you look at the forecasts of FOMC participants, we have unemployment remaining below 4% through the entire uh, projection period, and you have an inflation remaining right around 2%. So we're not we're not acting on it as though we're some certain number. Uh, we're we're very much I think we're very open-minded about about both what the what the uh, what the level of the natural rate is and also what the implications are for inflation. I think it would go too far to just ignore resource constraints completely because we can we can get the old inflation dynamics back over time if we want to, where where there was a very strong relationship between changes in slack and inflation. But I think that's the way I would think about it. How about this linkage? Uh, part of the traditional Phillips curve relationship is low unemployment creates uh, tight labor market wage pressures, which flows through to, to broader inflation. There's that. There's two steps there. There's yeah. tight labor market to higher wages, higher wages to uh, overall inflation, and that's the linkage we haven't seen as much of lately. How do you think about? But both of those links have weakened significantly since you know since uh, we were young, since the 1960s, since I was young anyway. Um, before you were born, <laughs> uh, so uh, they weakened a lot. And I, I've mentioned, you know, we, we had we had um, wages going up faster than productivity plus inflation during the latter part of the of the 1990s expansion without having price inflation. So we, we, we there there is a, the, the link between the two between wage inflation inflation and price inflation is pretty weak. And you know, wages going up is not necessarily inflationary, and we know that very well. I mean, I think. We, we have inflation under under four uh, percent. Sorry, unemployment under four percent for nine months now. We have inflation under control, and uh, I mean, I think I think that's a pretty good outcome, and, and we sure think it can continue. Dr. Bernanke, is the Phillips curve dead or just really flat and really uncertain? So, th so to use a slang, uh, economics jargon, this is an endogenous phenomenon. <laughs> uh, Chairman Volcker and Greenspan did the three of us a big favor by bringing inflation under control and helping to anchor inflation expectations very closely to roughly 2%. And we formalized that target, I think, in, in 2012. Uh, Janet and I were, uh, you know, in our, in our terms, were very uh, supportive of, ec of economic growth and employment. This was an incredibly important uh, objective for us. But it was very helpful that inflation expectations were so well anchored and it gave us flexibility, the ability to, uh, to take very uh, stimulative steps without worrying that inflation expectations would drift off and that inflation would become an immediate problem. So uh, that's sort of a capital asset that central banks have, that, that inflation expectations are so well anchored and stable. And that's the, quote, endogenous reason why the slope curve is so flat. That allows us, uh, and uh, Jay, to be, uh, you know, to explore the range of, you know, how far unemployment can decline and to be aggressive at times when necessary. But ultimately, you want to protect that capital asset. You also don't want to allow inflation to persistently deviate from, you know, the target area uh, because of the cost that, you know, if you, if you did uh, unanchor inflation expectations, which I don't expect to happen, that would, you know, that would be costly in terms of your ability in the future to stabilize the economy. I wonder, 
uh, Dr. Yellen, on, on, on regulation. Um, a real emphasis of the Fed since the crisis has been macroprudential regulation, the idea of, of regulating the financial system, accounting for uh, risks to the macro economy. Uh, how confident are you that the financial system we now have will prove resilient? Uh, is there anything you would like to see the current Fed or other regulators do to, to strengthen that, uh, that capacity? Well, I think a lot's been accomplished and the financial system is definitely in better shape. There's more capital, higher quality capital. The institution of stress tests is a very important supervisory uh, innovation, maybe the, the most important um, in terms of aiding public understanding of what's happening in systemically important banks and um, encouraging better risk management in those banks. Um, derivatives are safer. Many now are, that are standardized or centrally cleared. There are much higher margin requirements on those that are not centrally cleared. Um, there's been money market reform. So um, a lot of things have happened that I think have left us with a safer financial system. That said, um, I'd say it's a, work in, it's a work in progress, and there is more work to be done. Um, I, I worry about the fact you said macroprudential tools. I actually think in the United States we have a shortage of macroprudential tools. So um, while we've made the system year in and year out more resilient, if we were to see a threat like house prices rising, um, we we're concerned that a bubble is developing. Many countries um, have tools that a financial stability board could invoke. Um, they wouldn't be invoked because anyone's worried about the safety of a particular banking institution. The concern would be that um, escalating house prices and the potential for a collapse um, could cause a deep and long recession. And um, many countries, for example, would raise, um, uh, put, put caps on loan-to-value ratios and lending. Canada's been doing some of this. Right. And there are lots of countries, a lot of Asian countries are doing that as well. The Bank of England has uh, tools as well that they have used. We actually don't have such tools in the United States, and that worries me. And. Um, Although the Fed got new tools if there were a problem in a systemic uh, institution that would help to resolve um, a, a, a systemically important non-bank, say an investment banking sub of a bank holding company, um, we, we've lost some of the emergency lending powers that were used um, during the downturn, for example, um, to support AIG, who's uh, collapse, I think, would have been disastrous at the time. So uh, I do have some concerns. Chair Powell, do you believe you have the tools you need to, uh, to deal with financial systemic risk? Well, I, I, I would agree with Janet that we, we don't have um, a lot of uh, tools that we can move around as a cyclical matter. So we've had to make up for that by having, through the cycle, macroprudential policies. Uh, and and I, would, I would characterize the stress test uh, particularly for this, for the largest institutions, the stress test and also the, uh, the the very high capital requirements and liquidity requirements and resolution requirements that we have on the most systemically important. So those are through the cycle measures, which are always on. I think we're not strong in terms of having tools that we can turn off and on. And frankly, that that's just a fact of life for us. I think that there's a, a long history of, of uh, and not a happy history of trying to use things like loan to value ratios. They don't they don't survive very well. The other thing about the United States, of course, is that most credit intermediation takes place in the financial markets, not the regulated, supervised banking system. And that's, that's just a different thing. You know, it's not a prudent, the financial capital markets are not prudentially regulated. It's completely different. And it's, it's a real strength from a capital raising and dynamism standpoint. But uh, it's something, you know, something we've worked on a, a lot. And I think, that, you know, I think what we've done with the banks is, is, is a good body of work, and I feel good about where the banks are. I feel, and I also feel fine about the capital markets, but I think there's, there's more to be done in central clearing, for yes. example, and there's more to be done um, in the capital markets generally. So if I could step away from economic policy for a moment to talk about the economics profession. Um, Dr. Bernanke, you, uh, you become president of AEA later today. 
Dr. Yellen, you uh, take over that job a year from now. Uh, my colleagues Jim Tankersley and Ben Castleman have uh, reported on accusations of harassment and, abu and uh, abusive behavior by Roland Fryer at Harvard. Uh, they tell me they've received many tips about bad behavior by other senior economists at leading universities since that story was published. Uh, my question for both of you is, is this. What, what more needs to happen to, uh, to ensure the economics profession is welcoming to all types of people, that abusive behavior isn't tolerated, uh, and what more can uh, AEA and other institutions and universities themselves be doing to, to make that the case? Well, economics has, certainly has a problem. We have uh, a very low ratio of women in terms of our professional ranks, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, a reputation for hostility towards women and minorities seems to be an important reason why many women choose not to become economists. That's bad for them, and it's bad for the profession because we're losing a major source of talent and insight. Um, as you mentioned, I'm becoming the president of the American Economic Association. Janet will follow me. We work together on this. I think this should be our top priority. Uh, we are currently, uh, the AEA is currently uh, conducting a survey of its membership on professional climate, asking people to report uh, things that have happened to them in general or specifically. Uh, AEA members here or who are listening, if you haven't filled out your, your survey, please, please do that. Um, that will help, that information will help us think about, you know, next steps. But I think in general, we've got to work much harder to uh, increase women's participation in economics. Um, a small example of that is that uh, I appointed a 19-person committee to pick all the papers and sessions that are in the Atlanta meetings here. 11 of the 19 are female, and I hope that will add perspective to, to these meetings. Uh, we've also introduced a new website for job market uh, discussions, which is intended to make it unnecessary to go to a private sector website that had a lot of bad reputation in terms of uh, misogynistic comments and so on. And we're going to continue our efforts to, mo uh, to mentor uh, young women and minorities at the college level, graduate level, uh, and, and up, the, up the chain. Uh, unfortunately, this is a long pipeline. It takes a long time uh, to, to transform an interested undergraduate into a senior professor. But we are very committed to this. Um, I'm sure Janet will want to add to this, but uh, I think it's very important for economics that we, we change the equilibrium here, that we change the perception of economics as, as being unfriendly uh, to any group of people. Dr. Yellen? Yeah, well, I agree. I'm very supportive. I agree this should be the highest uh, priority for us over the next couple of years. The AEA has formed a new committee to um, focus on initiatives that might be successful in improving the environment for women and I think uh, and minorities and I think this climate survey uh, perhaps will be something that can provide useful uh, feedback to individual economics departments um, about how they uh, compare to uh, their climate to the profession as a whole uh, I think this committee will look at best practices that departments can put in place to try to um, improve the climate generally for women and uh, try to come up with a broad array. There has been the adoption recently of a code of conduct uh, for economists that focuses on the importance of diversity. Chair Powell, you, uh, you may employ more PhD economists than anyone. How is the Fed thinking of these issues? Yeah, so the Fed is an important, uh, you know, institution in the economics profession and in the country. And um, so I very much want to follow in Janet and Ben's footsteps and, and say that diversity and inclusion is a, a top priority for us. The, the kind of behavior that we read about is totally unacceptable and will not be tolerated um, at the Fed. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're committed to a diverse and uh, inclusive uh, environment. I really strongly believe that diverse perspectives are not only do you get better results, but you'll, you know, the, the, the young people coming up are accustomed to a diverse and inclusive environments, and, and, and they're going to want to work at places like that. So part of our business model is to attract the young talent. I want the Fed to be known within the economics profession as a great place for women and minorities and other diverse people to, to work and be happy and be listened to. So, uh, Dr. Bernanke and Yellen, you, you both uh, had excellent uh, academic careers, and you both made decisions to move into public service at various stages. Um, you know, I, I think in the standards, you get a PhD, you go to university, you try and get tenure, 
Um, that is not the usual uh, stepping stone. Uh, can you reflect on, on what role public service played in your own career, your own uh, evolution, and, and what you would recommend to, to younger scholars out there trying to decide, should I try and do a year at CEA? Should I do a fellowship at the Fed, something like that? Well, it was something that figured in my thinking as um, something I'd like to have as part of my career. From my undergraduate days, it was a motivation for me to study economics. I hoped that I would have a chance to serve at the Fed, um, to serve at the Council of Economic Advisors. I've always seen economics as um, a body of um, understanding and of work that is highly relevant to the design of public policy and felt that economists can contribute to making the world a better and more successful place by uh, helping to apply that knowledge. So it's something I always wanted to do and it was part of my motivation. And I think as I've gone back and forth between um, academia and uh, public policy jobs, I found that what I've, uh, the knowledge I've gained in academia, the sort of systematic way of analyzing data and thinking about how the world works is highly relevant in designing public policy. And what one learns in policy jobs then is tremendously enriching in terms of one's research that um, going to spending a year at the CEA or longer or serving at the Fed alerts you to interesting problems that you may not have been aware of and um, can really enrich one's, re enrich one's research. And so there are benefits flowing in both directions. What are some of the insights you think you got from wor working in the policy world that helped make you a better academic, a better researcher? Um, I mean, it's a question of what problem should um, should one work on, and um, you know, I think in that in that regard, I always think about the fact that the Fed, um, in the run up to the financial crisis and having to deal with zero interest rates and um, thinking about what was possible to do in a zero interest rate world, um, you had an active body of research that had taken place inside the Fed and in academia motivated by Japan's problem. So um, people in the Fed looking, and Ben spoke about this in a number of speeches, um, that you, know, you, you see a real world problem. It, it motivated research and then that research was available when we found ourselves um, in that same situation later. So, um, real-world phenomena motivated important research. You, you came in fairly late in your career to, to become a Fed governor. Reflect on, on that. Yeah, I was a lifetime academic until I got this phone call in 2002. <laughs> was Glenn Hubbard, yeah. as I recall? Glenn yeah. Hubbard called me from the, from the White House and said, would you like to come talk about being on the board of, of governors at the Fed? And, uh, you know, Keynes famously said that economists should strive to be as useful as dentists. <laughs> um, and economics, after all, is not uh, all that aesthetic a uh, field. It's, it's, it's supposed to be a practical field. If what you're doing has no relevance whatsoever to actual policy, then it, you, know, you should question that. Um, and I had studied monetary policy and financial markets and economic history, and this was an opportunity to, in some sense, put it to use and, uh, and to get the feedback of you know, experience of, of seeing how these things worked worked in practice and, and understanding the, the policy-making context. Um, so, so I, I just want to say for, for young people that, that in economics, at least, the silos don't seem to me to be that strong. I mean, it's not that hard uh, for a young person uh, finishing uh, undergraduate to do a, a summer internship at the Federal Reserve, for example, uh, move back and forth, uh, have a visiting appointment at, at uh, the Council of Economic Advisors or the BLS or the census um, to move back and forth between uh, academic and, and policy work. Um, and I think it's, it's very stimulating. It, it gives you things, it gives you ideas about what to work on. It gives you institutional knowledge, which is useful in informing your, um, your, your analysis. It gives you contacts that will be helpful you know, as, you, as you try to get data or do whatever else you want to do to, to get, your, uh, get your work done. So I, you know, it's not for everyone, of course, but, but for those who have strong policy interests, you know, uh, an academic with policy uh, type of career, I think, is quite feasible in economics.
Why didn't you, you, you did two years? Well, why didn't you do two years as governor and go back to Princeton? What what appealed to you about staying in Washington and going through the very remarkable 15 well, years? Well, it was an interesting experience. period of time, and I had some interesting <laughs> opportunities. I I, uh, I did my two years at, at the board of governors. Then I got the offer to be the CEA chairman, which Janet has also done. Um, Kevin Hassett will be speaking uh, here soon. Um, I think that's one of the most interesting jobs in Washington, to be honest with you, because you get to be in the White House and you get to work on all the different issues which are coming across the, you know, the policy desk. Uh, so that opportunity arose, and then I was appointed chair. So, I, you know, I, I was kind of overwhelmed with the opportunities that I had. But, but uh, I maintained a relationship with Princeton. I still, I still do, uh, and I still have uh, do research and make presentations at academic seminars and the like. So. Um, I certainly haven't abandoned the academic life, but uh, again, I think for an economist with applied interests, uh, the ability to move across the policy and academic spheres is, 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 a, is a great benefit. So we have to wind down. Uh, last question. Uh, there are many, many uh, younger scholars here charting out their course of research and, and making their plans for, for their careers. Um, in terms of their research agendas and what they should be studying and trying to figure out, I wonder for all three of you what you would like to see them take on and, uh, and find solutions and answers that, that would have been helpful when you were Fed Chair. Uh, what, are, what are some of the questions that you wish the academic, uh, the economics profession had better answers to in this role? Starting with you, Jay Powell. You know, I, I would say the, the integration of financial economics and macroeconomics <clears throat> and understanding better how financial markets work and how finan changing financial conditions affect the macroeconomy. This was uh, something obviously Ben's been working on for a long time, but there's a lot of progress to be made there. I think it's still early days in, in working that out. And I would say something related, systemic risk, understanding what gives rise to systemic risk, how we can measure it, how we can detect it, and what kinds of tools um, might be relevant in addressing it. I think this has become a fertile area for research, but um, really the economics profession didn't see the financial crisis coming and um, a financial stability work that would um, put us on top of developments that might cause a future one, I think, should be high priority. I think one of the things we had trouble with was even after the crisis became severe, we, you know, we understood this was going to be a big blow to the economy, but we didn't have, like, have the tools to try to quantify how, how big and how persistent the impact on the overall real side of the economy was going to be. Um, even as late as the end of 2008, the Fed staff was still forecasting that unemployment was going to peak at 7%, uh, when, of course, it went to 10%. So we didn't really have, at that time, we didn't have the tools for understanding, again, as Jay was saying, this interaction between financial instability and the real economy. And I think a lot of progress has been made on that, but it's an area of obvious interest. I would say again, for, for younger scholars, that uh, some of the most interesting issues are, go beyond the monetary range. Um, you know, politically around the world, we're seeing concerns about inequality, about opportunity, um, wages, uh, the effects of globalization and growth and, uh, and uh, technology on, 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 on job markets. So uh, David Otter, another advertisement, will talk about some of these things in the Ely lecture, but um, I think that's an area where there's an awful lot to be done to better understand the dynamics of opportunity in a world where labor markets are changing so, so radically. Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, Jay Powell, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.